good evening. Can you hear me? A good evening. You can hear me? Okay, because I can't hear myself a little bit. Uh, well, uh, before, I, uh, before the service, we have a time of prayer there. And, uh, and when I was praying, the Lord revealed to me a vision where there was a person, it was evening tide, it was time when the sun was going down. And a person came in front of me and uh, there was a bronze city. A bronze city, it was like a kingdom, a bronze kingdom. And the sun was going down, it was dark, but even, during, even from the darkness you can see a glimpse of this bronze huge city. And this person was being expelled from this city. And this person was as if was looking towards that city and, and just, just looking and gazing into the city. A little time passed by and all of a sudden the, the Lord Jesus began to light up that city in the midst of it and it was becoming daytime and this bronze city was glistening and it was full of light as if it was restored to a glory that it has known before and the Lord Jesus asked that man who was outside and said you now come to your rightful place I don't know whether this is a word of God for any of you but if it is a word I definitely feel during these times where we we speak of financial breakthrough the Lord is restoring your place in the city where Jesus is King hallelujah praise God hallelujah actually I was so happy when Uncle Lalit took and the ministration time I was thinking hey let this ministration time go on because if I felt such a presence of God shall we give a hand clap to Jesus he really ministers to his people hallelujah we thank you we thank you we thank you we are in a series uh, of study on financial breakthrough and last time I think we started and we will go on for another two or three Sundays when it comes to finances the when it comes to financial blessing we really need to know how to receive from God one of the greatest hindrances of financial breakthrough is that we really do not know to receive from God and one of the main hindrances of receiving is the poverty or the scarcity mindset. Now some people call this the spirit of poverty. Now why do people call it the spirit of poverty? It is because the spirit of poverty is not associated with the abundance or lack of finances. You can be very rich, but yet you can have a spirit of poverty. You can be very poor yet have a spirit of poverty. This is why it, the, the scarcity mindset is so prevalent and that is one of the main reasons why people of God find it so difficult to break through when it comes to blessing. Now there are two areas that we are going to deal with today and one of the areas is to consider God as your source. Now tell me source. God is the source of everything. And we are going to look into detail how God becomes, when God becomes the source, how effective our lives are going to be. And the second area of the poverty mindset is the bondage of debt. How if we, are debt, if we have a lot of debt in our life, how the spirit of debt can keep us from the generous spirit we ought to have. Right, let's consider... Uh, the spirit, uh, the, the source. Let's consider the source. Now the spirit of poverty is a state when a person loses his view of the source, when, when a person loses the view of who gave the finances, who gave the blessing, the person begins to un identify himself as the owner of the blessing. Okay, And when you lose sight of the source, the spirit of poverty takes over. Now if you just consider yourself and you think you are the supplier of yourself, 
how poor that statement is. Just imagine you say, my God shall supply all my needs. Immediately you know there's a greater power and a depth in that statement. If you are the only supplier for your life, that's a very poor statement. Now I want you to consider God as our source of all things. And when you see God as the source, your life will begin to change dramatically. I think most of us would approach life considering our circumstances. We tend to figure things out and make decisions with our circumstances in view. But if you start with the source, as God as the source, things will begin to change and we would, go, we would see in a little while. Now when you open the Bible, the word source is quite prevalent in the Bible. And it is not only prevalent, it is pre preeminent. Now if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, shall we read it together? Genesis 1 verse 1. I think it's there I have. Genesis 1 verse 1. Shall we all read it together? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It says, in the beginning, God. Now you will be amazed to see your name is not there. My name is not there. Our relatives are not there. In the beginning, God. The Lord says, before you consider any matter, before you consider anything, in the beginning, God. You better understand this whole thing got started with God. Okay? Now the encouraging thing about knowing this is that if you consider God as your source, He is He is li liable to complete what He has initiated. He is responsible to fulfill what He has initiated. If you consider God as your source, He is responsible for that. Now I feel sad for people who do not believe in God because the only place of refuge they have is within themselves. They want help, they look to themselves. They look for encouragement, they look to themselves. And you and I know, you are a limited resource, I am a limited resource. If we have only ourselves for our help, how poor that is. But if we connect to the source, we get in touch with the unlimited resource. If you consider the source, we tap into a power that, is, that supersedes all powers. When we tap into that source, God's provision flows in our life. God's healing flows in our lives. His protection becomes evident because we consider the source. Hallelujah. Let me take you some scriptures from Ephesians 3 verses 14. Shall we read this together? This is Paul considering the source of his life. Paul in this scripture is considering God as the source of his entire being. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Paul is saying, I bow my knee to the source of my life. I bow my knee to the Father who is all-powerful. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. He is saying, I am considering the source of my life who strengthens me. Okay, next part. And to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge. When you know the source of your life, the source of your finances, the source of your health, there is a love of God that surpasses knowledge. Now tell, tell, repeat with me, I don't want my small mind to limit the blessings 
of God's love. Repeat with me. I don't want to limit my blessing with the smallness of other people whom I know. Uh, but know the love of God. It is something when we, our small mind, can think only of ourselves. When we focus ourselves on us, we become small, whereas our blessing becomes small. If you can focus your eyes on the source, you will be amazed to see the blessings God gives you of his love. Okay. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that is work in you. Dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't say he is able to do above and beyond according to the skill level you have. It doesn't say he is able to do above and beyond to our personhood. It doesn't say he is able to do above and beyond to the status of our life. He says he is able to do above and beyond according to the power that is work within us. Hallelujah. Now I want you to turn to your rear seat and greet them and say to five people, God is going to do above and beyond in your life. Now, greet one another. God is going to do above and beyond in your life. Hallelujah. Okay, you greeted five people. God is going to do above and beyond in your life. Now, the thing is, if when we come to Christ, we need to have this mentality of more. Repeat with me more. When we tap into God, as God as our source, we have this mentality of more. Now, now uh, we as a church can get easily satisfied with the people whom we have reached, call ourselves the blessed of God, and get settled down to us serving us, and feeling the presence of God for ourselves, and become snugly, our lives can turn it to be we feeling the presence of God for ourselves. We are happy with what we have. We are happy with the blessing God has given us. Of course, we need to be happy. But in our lives as a Christian, in our lives of connecting to God, there has to be always this overarching uh, uh, presence and over, over, uh, uh, his overwhelming presence of knowing there is more. Our union with Christ enables us to understand there is more. Hallelujah. The more comes into our life when we consider God as our source. When we lose focus of God as our source, we become so small and we lose out on the more. Hallelujah. Now today, I just want to ask four questions from you and I'm, I hope that you can write this down if you may so that you can pray, you can think about it when you go home to know whether you really have a generous spirit or whether you are in the poverty spirit. I want to ask you four questions and I'm going to take you to these four questions because if you step into God, there is so much of blessing that God has for you. The first thing is, I just want to know whether you feel entrusted or entitled. Can I have the slide, please? Entrusted or enti entitled. The person who has a more mindset, the person who has a generous mindset or a liberal mindset, a mindset of abundance, lives in an open heaven, under an open heaven. The person who considers God as his source lives under God's provision and it is not a philosophy, it's not a proposition, 
it is it is a living reality you consider god as your source your life expands to accommodate the more god has and god's eternal provision love blessings become part of your life and you begin to live life as if it is beyond earth hallelujah now um when a person sees that they are entrusted and not entitled our heart begins to expand but if you lose sight of the source that god entrusted you with the blessing you can feel the blessing is entitled to me i own the blessing you can feel like that a person who is entitled will not say thank you very much because it is his a person who is entitled would not come early and would not stay up late it would be bet it would be a blessing if they even turn up people who are entitled will do what you ask them to do but would not do anything more because they feel i own the blessing i have people who are entrusted are quite different entrusted people see everything that they have comes from somewhere beyond themselves they live life differently they live a life of miracles abundance a more life a life of release a life of freedom a life of expectancy because they know everything they have comes from something that is beyond them hallelujah now you have to decide whether you will become a owner of your blessing or you will become a steward of your blessing what will a steward do a steward will safeguard the blessing will want to increase it a owner of the blessing feels hey this is my blessing and their person becomes limited hallelujah now we will look into a passage of scripture from john 12 verses 14 to 21 john uh, luke 12 14 to 21 Jesus was a man was coming to discuss about possessions. Now this is the exact thing that we are talking the three or four Sundays. And the, and a person came and said uh should I share my possession with my brother? And Jesus says friend he said to him who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you okay? He then told them watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possession now this is a strong statement now we all know that all of us need life need many things to feel happy isn't it many of us need so many things in life to feel happy none of us are happy by themselves and the scripture tells jesus gave, gives a powerful warning and says a man's life is not consisted the uh, one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions now Sometimes you may say yes Jehan I agree I agree with the Lord Jesus that my life doesn't consist with the abundance of my house You may say okay I agree but you will you will find it amazing and strange to find knowing that man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of his possessions how freely we think that our life consists of the abundance of our possessions while we go through this parable you will find how easy it is to think your life consists of the possessions you have and jesus says watch out 
and be on guard against all greed. Now that means there are many kinds of greed. One person may be greedy with his money, but generous with time. Another person will be generous with the time, but greedy with the money. But none of them will have a strong, none of them will go deep into the kingdom because they are held by their greed. Your greed and my greed will differ. I may not be greedy in the same thing that you are greedy of, and you may not be greedy of the things that I am greedy of. But the Bible tells there are so many kinds of greed. Watch out that you don't involve yourself in greed. Okay, let's move on. Then he told them a parable, a rich man's land was very productive. Okay. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store up my crops? Okay. I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and all my goods there. Now this, there was a man who was very rich. In that time, when you have rich and when you have so abundance, he was very rich. He thought to himself, what, he thought to himself, what can I do with my finances? What am I to do with my finances? He thought and said, okay, I will take down my barns, I will build bigger barns so that my children will have grain, my grandchildren will have grain, and my great-grandchildren will also have grain. And he stored up wealth, built bigger barns, and we'll remove on what Jesus said. Verse 19, then I'll say to myself, you have many good goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Now, how many of you know verse 19 is an assumption? How many of you know you have many goods stored up for many years is an assumption? Is it truth? Or is it an assumption? Brothers, we do not know what will happen to us tomorrow. Tomorrow is never ours. If God is good to us, yes, we will thrive tomorrow. If something bad happens, we don't know what's there tomorrow. This man thought goods is something like food, water, and air. I have so that I can consume it myself. I must safeguard it like food, water, and air. I must safeguard it so that I can have merry, I can believe myself easily. Now, how many of you know if you have abundance and you ha can build bigger barns, how many of you will consider this man a wise man? I personally will consider this man, if not for the spiritual aspect, a wise man. He has a lot of fruit, a lot of grain. He's built bigger barns so that the fruit will not get spoiled. But look at the next verse. <coughs> But God said to him, you fool. Isn't it strange? Now how many of you honestly think this man was a fool? How, how many of you honestly think this man was a wise man? Nobody. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to show how many of you, if given this scenario, how many of you think this man is a wise man? Okay, a few. 
How many of you think that this man is a fool? Okay, one. Now, it says, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will, it they, will they be? Jesus said, you fool, because he bought into the lie the abundance of your house in, is where your life consisted. He forgot the source. He thought to himself. He put God out of the picture. He thought this whole wealth, this whole of abundance is for me. I must safeguard it. I love it. I stored it. And you enter into the lie your life consisted in the possessions of your house. And Jesus, when he saw this and said, you fool. God said, you fool, you do not know what, brings, what tomorrow brings. This is how it will happen to those who feel entitled. They feel this is mine, this is mine. The Lord was not mad because the person was rich. He wanted him to remember the blesser. He forgot his source and God wanted him to remember, you remember me. Now, the brothers and sisters tell me, who gave this man wealth? God. Who made the land productive? God, who made him, who, who placed him in such a position where he could gather his crops? God. But when your goods increase, there is a tendency that you can forget the source. And God says, you fool. Sometimes, when a preacher tells you, hey brother or sister, you must bring your 10% to God. You must bring your tithe to the church. And some people honestly get mad because they feel they are entitled, they are own it, but not stewards. If you feel you are a steward of the abundance of God, what you gave, you will be very careful to honor your Honor God with your wealth. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses was preparing the people of Israel to enter into the land of, of the Canaanites. Moses was preparing them and, and God was going to give them a blessed land. He took them out from Egypt and he led them through the desert. And now God is preparing and telling Moses, Moses, you need to prepare the people of God to enter the promised land. So, so Moses gives these instructions, what he has heard from God to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 to 9. <clears throat> For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams of water, springs and deep water sources, following in both valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, wines, figs and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose hills you will mine copper. Now, how many of you know that God has no problem in blessing you? How many of you know it is God's heart to bless you? When God blesses you, he brings you to this land where there is streams, there is water, there is wheat, barley. Even if you dig the hill, you get iron. Even if you dig the valley, you get copper. He was going to give them a superb land. A land that is like no other. Okay, we'll read on. We'll read on, uh, verse 10. When you eat and are full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land he 
has given you. Now this is a command. When you eat and you are full, you will praise the Lord for the good land he has given you. Now whose land was this land? God's land. And who gave it to them? God gave it. God's land, God gave it to his people. To whom does the land belong? God. Okay, we'll read on. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord God by failing to keep his command. The audiences and the statutes I'm giving you today, when you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. The Lord was saying, dear brothers, dear people, listen to me. When your flocks increase, when your houses are nicely built, when your houses are filled with goods, you can, your heart can be proud and you can disconnect with the source. He was saying, my children, never forget the place where you got this from. Never remember the source from which you got this land. The Lord said, you were in the land of slavery. I took you out. I took you out. Have you been through a rock and a hard place and God sought you through? Have you been in a place of difficulty and God you took you out? Have you been? You have been. Yes, there were some struggles, but you have come into the promised land. But after you come to the promised land, you may forget the source of your blessing. And God said, be careful. Shall we read a little further? Verses 17 and and lead you through the great and the terrible wilderness with the poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint like rock for you. Okay. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to humble and test you so that in the end he might cause you to prosper. Verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But, the, but remember that the Lord your God gave you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant. He swore to your fathers as it is today. Dear brothers and sisters, one significant way the spirit of poverty comes on people is to think their wealth is their own and they are entitled it. When the truth is, God has given you as a steward. Are you willing to change focus and begin to think you are a steward of the blessings God has given you? You are a steward of what I own. The whole thing belongs to God and I will honor God with the 10% or with whatever you want, 10% and whatever that is extra. And God wants to bless you because the moment you give the tithe, you acknowledge and say, God, I know you are my source. Hallelujah. God wants you to remember the source. God wants to remember where did you get your blessing. God wants you to remember and acknowledge that he is the good God. God wants you to acknowledge his wonderful power in bringing you out of slavery. My brothers and sisters, our, our finances may increase, but never get to the state where you lose sight of the source because God
God is the source of all you have. Hallelujah. My second point is, when it comes to giving, when it comes to giving, can I have the slide? Do you give out of relationship or reluctance? Do you give out of relationship or reluctance? In the Bible, it says, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he wrote them a poem. Does it say that? God so loved the world that he sang a song to them or he prayed to them. God so loved the world and he and he gave. The true nature of love is what? Give. Husbands, if you truly love your wife, you will give. Wives, if you truly love your husbands, you will give. Children, if you truly love your parents, you will give. Parents, if you truly love your children, you will give. If you are not a giver, you may argue the matter a thousand times. You can argue your case a thousand times. But according to scripture, your argument doesn't match up. You may say, Lord, I love you. Hey, the first thing, are you a giver to God? I'm not only saying money, are you giver of your time? Are you giver of your emotions? Are you giver of your prayers? Are you a giver of your wealth? Are you a giver of your talents and abilities? Are you a giver to God? However much you argue the point, if you are not a giver, it falls flat. Love gives. You may say, I love my church. The underlying thing, are you a giver to the church? Are you a giver of your time, your energy, your strength, your finances? Are you a giver? You may argue a thousand times, but if you are not a giver, it falls flat. God wants you to give out of relationship. When it comes to relationship, do you give with reluctance? When you see a need, if the first impulse is a reluctance to meet the need, that shows that you have still not understood the gospel fully. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, do you think that Jesus died because he had to die? No, Jesus didn't have to die. Why did Jesus die? The Bible tells he endured the cross for the joy set before him, enduring its shame. Jesus died for you and me for the joy of laying down his life for you and me. Now when Jesus died, he endured a shame. What is the shame he endured? The shame was you and I. He endured our shame. He endured the fallenness of human beings. He endured the fallenness and the God-forsaking ways we have. He endured our shame and he gave himself for us. Hallelujah. I don't want to spend much time. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 to 10. Remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not out of regret or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and God is able to make every grace overflow to you. God loves a cheerful giver. Right, number three, point number three. First question is, are you entrusted or do you feel entitled? Do you feel you are entrusted? Second point is, are you giving out of relationship or out of reluctance? 
I'm not only talking of money. Third thing is, are you obedient or is it an option only? It takes faith to put God first. When you decide to bring your tithe, you're weighing the pros and the cons. Well, you have lost the battle already because you are not obeying. You, there has to be no dialogue, but there has to be no argument. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy 6.17, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. When your focus is on yourself, sometimes you are worried whether my stuff will go around, whether I will have enough stuff to go around. But when your strength and the source is God, God gives all things for you to enjoy. Hallelujah. Don't you like to be in that state where God gives you everything to enjoy? Okay, I will come to my final point and we will go to the second aspect. Are you okay? Are you tired? Do you want some more or do you think we should come to a close after this? Can you take a little bit more? A little bit more? Okay, okay. Fourth thing is multiply, uh, multiply or maintain. What when you have your finances, what do you, what is your aim to maintain it or you multiply it? If you want to multiply it, you need God's help. If you want to multiply it, you need the abundance of God for it. If you want to maintain it, well. That's your decision because you are well able to maintain. Sometimes we become stingy because we want to maintain. But it's your real attitude of multiplying or maintaining. If you read the 2 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, the last verse, 10. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10. Now the one who provides seed for the sower. Uh, sorry, verse 9, please. Uh, that you can be generous in every occasion, that is what I want. Each person should do as he has decided, not out of regret or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Each person should do as he decided in his heart, not out of regret or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you. God is able to make all grace overflow to you. He is not only interested in your bank account, he is not only increasing your bank account, but he is going to bless you in every way, in every way, blessings that money cannot buy. That will mean good relationships, enrichment in your thoughts, enrichment in, your, in, your, in the way you conduct yourself. God is going to make all grace abound to you because when you give to God, God blesses you in every way. He doesn't only increase your bank account. Right? Always having everything you need, when you, when you sow to God, you will have everything you need. And what is the purpose that you may excel in? Every good work, another translation says that you can be generous in every occasion. God blesses you so that you can be generous in every occasion. Hallelujah. Our God is a great God. Right. Now, now we, will, uh, we will rise to our feet once again. And we will just, just absorb. And today we will just we will rise to our feet because the second part also will have 5-10 minutes. I think we need to stand and stretch ourselves out. Otherwise we will. Today we will try to receive from the Lord. And try to focus ourselves and say, Lord, I acknowledge that you are the source of my finances. Lord, I acknowledge that you are the source of my finances. Hallelujah. Will you raise a small cry to God? Okay. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you, Father. Oh Lord, we give you the glory and we praise you, we worship you, Lord. Shall we raise our hearts to him? Shall we raise our hearts to him? Can I call the worship team to come? 
Hallelujah. Can I call the worship team to come? Oh Lord, we bless you. Today is a time that we can trust God. We can connect to our souls. We can connect to our, our provider. And Father, we just want to thank you. We bless you. Hallelujah. Can